welcome to Chaa with Roma. This afternoon, I am with Liz Berry, multi-award winning poet from Birmingham. Hello, Liz. Hi, Roma. How nice to be here with you. <laughs> It's so nice to see you. I know. We've got the sunshine today as well, so we're very lucky, aren't we? You brought the sun. I did. I bought it from Birmingham. Yeah. Special Birmingham sunshine. Hi, Birmingham sunshine. <laughs> Extra bright. <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> I've been away for three days. <laughs> Um, Liz, I was wondering if you could begin with a poem, perhaps treat us to a poem first. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you'd like to hear? Yes, particular? please. The Republic of Motherhood. The biggie. The Republic of Motherhood. I crossed the border into the Republic of Motherhood and found it a queendom, a wild queendom. I handed over my clothes and took its uniform, its dressing gown and undergarments, a cardigan soft as a creature smelling of birth and milk. And I lay down in Motherhood's bed, the bed I had made, but could not sleep in, for I was called at once to work in the factory of Motherhood, the L shift. Graveyard shift, feeding, cleaning, loving, feeding. I walked home, heart sore through pale streets, the coins of motherhood singing in my pockets. Then I soaked my spindle bones in the chill municipal baths of motherhood, watching strands of my hair float from my fingers. Each day, I push my pram through freeze and blossom down the wide boulevards of motherhood where poplars bent their branches to stroke my brow. I stood with my sisters in the queues of motherhood, the weighing clinic, the supermarket, waiting for its bureaucracies to open their doors. As required, I stood beneath the flag of motherhood and opened my mouth, although I did not know the anthem. When darkness fell, I pushed my pram home again. Boy Lamplight wrote urgent letters of complaint to the Department of Motherhood, but received no response. I grew sick and was healed in the hospitals of motherhood, with their long closed isolation wards and narrow beds watched over by a fat moon. The doctors were slender and efficient. And when I was well, they gave me my pram again so I could stare at the daffodils in the parks of motherhood while winds pierced my breasts like silver arrows. In snowfall, I haunted motherhood cemeteries, the sweet fallen beneath my feet. Our Lady of the birth trauma, our Lady of psychosis, I wanted to speak to them, tell them I understood, but the words came out scrambled. So I knelt instead and prayed in the chapel of motherhood. Prayed for that whole wild fucking queendom. Its sorrow, its unbearable skinless beauty and all the souls that were in it. I prayed and prayed until my voice was a night cry. Sunlight pixelating my face like a kaleidoscope. <laughs> Oh, that's, right. <laughs> that's it. We're done. <laughs> you can just stop now. You can just stop now. Liz, what a beautiful poem. Thank you. Anna. That's one of my most favorite poems that you've written recently. Thank After, you. of course, the multi award winning Black Country <laughs> <laughs> from Chato and Windus. Let's talk about vulnerability. I mean, I've, I, I'm not a mother yet. I have two dogs, of course. Mm -hmm but that's different from mothering a child mm -hmm. i could see my sister-in-law in total wreckage so it was she was struggling to um, juggle her full-time job and also mothering two children um because there is a lot of vulnerability in in that poem mm -hmm. and i think there's a misconception that when you write something vulnerable mm -hmm. or something that comes from your experience you are labeled as confessional poet mm -hmm. but actually it takes a lot of art and mastery mm -hmm. to make something that is wrecked and all over the place mm -hmm. beautiful true language mm -hmm. so if you could give us maybe some advice on how to craft 
a poem about vulnerability? Well, I think the first thing for me when we talk about this idea of vulnerability in poems is that in a poem in which I feel like I make myself vulnerable or reveal myself to be vulnerable, in a strange way it has the opposite effect for me because being coming vulnerable in your poem can actually be a really empowering thing. Mm -hmm. So the experience was very vulnerable making it you know, the experience in these poems about early motherhood or the poems in which you kind of reveal your own vulnerability. Those are vulnerable experiences, but the act of doing something creative with it and making a poem with it and making art out of it is actually a really empowering thing. Mm. So the, the experiences in these poems might be vulnerable, but the outcome wasn't for me. I didn't. Once the poem was out there in the world and connecting with other readers, mm. other women, other mothers, actually it felt incredibly powerful. Yeah, it's as if it transforms you yeah. as a poet. And once it's out there, it could also transform the reader. Not a lot of poets may um, understand that writing about something vulnerable or something too personal may empower you, especially I'm thinking about new poets or emerging poets. I was I was starting to write many years ago. I was always, there's always something that was holding me back on writing about nursing and migration because I don't know, I just feel like, why would I expose myself? Or why would I expose these difficult things that happened to me? Especially I'm a very private person. So if you were to talk to young poets or poets who are just starting to write and starting to juggle that kind of uh, question, uh, should I write about it? I think it's important, but not sure. How would you convince them? I'd just say, wait until you're ready. Mm. Maybe when you first start writing or you're first making your poems, perhaps that's just the time for learning your craft, learning how poems are made without feeling that the stakes are too high for you. You want mm. to just be able to feel free to play and learn and work out what kind of poems you want to make and how you're going to make them. And maybe when you've been through that process, then perhaps there's something about working with somebody else, somebody to encourage you or mm. guide you, or feeling that actually you know how to transform that experience into poems. Mm. I'd say to people, don't feel that you have to expose yourself. Mm. If you don't want to, I'm also really private, really private about mm. my kids and my life. So in a funny way, that book is very exposing. Mm. Um, but one thing about the Republic of Motherhood is I almost never mention the children in it. It's very much about the mums and the experience yes. of being a mum. I don't mind speaking about myself, revealing myself, but, um, but not my family or my children. So I think everyone finds their own place to draw the boundaries. Knowing your craft first or learning something about what craft means for you before actually going into, into that kind of vulnerable poem straight away. You mentioned something important, which is uh, finding someone to help you. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? I think it's something that's been a real great comfort to me as a poet, and actually to almost all the other poets I know, is finding what I think like a supportive community of poets mm -hmm. around you. So it might be friends or people you go to a workshop group with. It might be poets you really admire and you write to each other. It might be that you're mentored by somebody. But I think having that little circle of sort of support and encouragement and advice is really helpful in knowing that actually people are supporting you to get to get mm. to that good place in your work. Because I know that you've been mentored, Roma, haven't you? And you've been part of a really supportive yes. community of poets. Was yeah. that helpful to you? Very helpful. My first mentoring, my first official mentoring was Dynamo mm. by Nine Artists yeah. Press. So Jane did, uh, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Really, really long time ago. And from that moment, I think Jane from Nine Artists Press anyway, mm -hmm. she's always been there. And she's that kind of person who, yeah. you know, she'll always support you wherever you go. And then I have the Jerwood Arvon um, mentoring scheme with Pascal Petit. And then I went back to Nine Arches Press, mentored by Hannah Lau, True Primers. I wish I would have had that kind of long, long-term mentor with Hannah because she's so good. She's so good. She, Do you know, it's really interesting. Sometimes you just know the person 
that you need. So I've just finished yeah. the sort of edits for a new book and Hannah Lowe's the person that I asked to help with it. Really? Because I thought all the things I need to be good at for this book, been writing oh, a long wow. sequence of poems, it's a narrative. I was like, Hannah Lowe, it's got all the things I need to be good at. So I just wrote to her, Hannah, would you like would you help me? Wow. Help me because you've got all the things I need. So even now, yeah. I think no matter how sort of far on you get in your career, never be frightened to ask people for help. If, if you I want know, to work yeah. with something, work in a different way, and you know mm. another poet who's, who you think is brilliant at that, yeah. don't be frightened to reach out to them and say, yeah. help me, show me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Liz Berry is still needing help. I do. <laughs> and I think it's kind of, that's the yeah. good thing that you're always learning, aren't you? Whether you're learning from people that are more experienced or kind of newer poets as well, you learn that's a lot it, yeah. from them. That's so true, you know, like no matter how many years you have spent in the landscape. I'm talking as if I've spent many yeah. years. Those decades you spent. <laughs> Those decades I've spent here. Poetry. Exactly. So I, I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. Because sometimes I think, oh, I'm going, who mentors the, the, yeah. the superstars? <laughs> but I think it's about reaching out or kind of being willing to learn. Like recently I was reading mm. um, some poems for a poet called Amy Aker. Who's the editor oh, yes, of yes, Betty? Yes. And when I read that manuscript, it just kind of put a fire under me. Do you know, reading somebody really fresh oh. and exciting, really bold and unafraid, yeah. it kind of then inspires you to think, oh my God, I want that energy in my poems. So all yeah. the time you kind of take from other poets when you're working with them. Well, tell us a little bit about this work that you were, you know, <laughs> begging <laughs> Hannah <laughs> to help me. Begging Hannah <laughs> I know it's not on our script. <laughs> Hi, <not>. Hannah. <laughs> Um, how was that process then? Because obviously you have had made, you've made this, Black Country, mm -hmm. multi-award, Republic of Motherhood, award winning, and then you have this, and this new work, mm -hmm. you, still, you still need that kind of support. How was the process? So, the, I've just finished a book length sequence of poems that mm. tells a story, like, sort of a, a, a historical narrative and I've never written like that before. I've only ever written poem to poem. Mm. I've never got any overarching vision. Mm. I just go poem to poem. Um, so to speak to somebody about narrative and what goes in and what goes out and how to get in and out of a story is really helpful. Mm. It's just using, a, it's like learning a different bit of craft. Mm. Something that normally as a poet, you're just thinking of the single sort of poem all by itself in the page, but imagine it in the context of, of what it reveals, not repeating too much, making mm. sure things are really clear. Um, but I found it like delightfully immersive. I wrote it, sort of finished it off during the pandemic lockdowns. So being able to step out of my own life into somebody else's narrative just for exactly the right thing at that time and i guess that ties back to that kind of vulnerability isn't it because your republic of the republic of motherhood is already a vulnerable work mm -hmm. and i guess i'm not sure how much we can say but i guess this new work would deal with vulnerable subjects yeah. as well and it doesn't it, it so it's not it's sort of not personal exactly but it's a family story mm. but it deals with other people's vulnerabilities mm. so that question of how to handle or how to write about other people's sort of vulnerable moments again that that felt like another learning thing i had to do how to be respectful of other people's experiences or vulnerabilities to write about them in a way that didn't just repeat mm. sort of hurtful or traumatic things mm. but but, you know, sort of nurtured someone else's vulnerable experience. Because mm. it's a different way about writing your own. Mm. You know, you could claim it. Whereas if you're actually exploring someone else's experiences, like you said, you have to have that sort of um, nurturing in a way mm. of their narrative. So you mentioned something about not repeating the maybe the dark experiences mm -hmm. or the vulnerable experiences. So what do we do then? What else can we do? Masterclass from Lisbeth. Oh, I don't know, I'm kind of really new to it as well. I think for me, so the story that I've been writing is about mm -hmm. my great aunt, who is one of the British home children. So they're children from children's homes and orphanages that were forcibly emigrated out to the colonies to work um, in domestic and farm service. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to write about that experience, which mm -hmm. has been a really secret and shameful experience for those children and their families, it was hushed up for years. Mm -hmm. I had to write about that in a way that that doesn't create more sort of sorrow and trauma. Mm -hmm. So for me, the approach was writing about one particular girl is to focus 
and kind of the heart and soul of that girl and the voice of that girl. To be a girl of 12, what does it mean to be a girl mm. of 12? All the, the joys and the excitements and the love and tenderness, how easily bruised you are. So I think it was focusing on the, the sort of humanity at the centre of that story. Yeah. Everyone's approach is different. So I think of, of brilliant writers that do write about sort of tra traumatic experience or historical trauma. But I think you have to, every poet has to find their own way into exactly. it in a way that feels kind of sensitive and... and mm fit into the story. Yeah. My work is working with children and young people mm. who are very vulnerable. But when you look at them, as a professional, you see them and their vulnerability, the diagnosis that are given to them. But from their own perspective, they might not be seeing that straight away. Like you said, they are they may be seeing, you know, how it is like to fall in love, to have crushes at twelve years old, to see the world as still a bright place, even though it might not be <laughs> But you've got all that twelveness in there, yeah. as well as all the other sort of the other things, the other forces that are impacting on them. Yeah. Every time I think about you, I am reminded by this poem mm. from the anthology *Slow Chrysanthemum*, mm -hmm. which is a classical Korean poems in Chinese. It's a mm -hmm. translated anthology, and the poem was by poet Yi Kyubo to my son, editing my poems. Mm -hmm. This is this is one I should pause because I forgot the anthology. Oh. I was gonna, <laughs> okay, I was okay, gonna okay. read a line. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Camera action. Yeah. So I am reminded by your your personality as a mm -hmm. West Midland poet. I always think of you when I read this. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna read this poem oh. to my son editing my poems. Mm -hmm. I have always feared withering sooner than grass and trees but I find the volumes of my poor poems worse than nothing. Who will know, a thousand years from now, that a man named Yi was born in a corner of Korea? And I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why, why you remind me of this poem. <laughs> it's because... <sighs> you know how hard it is to be a poet from the Midlands and also from other corners of the world. But you still emerge. You're nationally known. Actually, internationally known. I think that your story is just really inspiring, especially if, if you're that person from the corner of Korea or from the corner of <laughs> Dudley. Corner of Dudley. <laughs> <laughs> Sedgley. <laughs> corner of Sedgley or Dudley. Or a person in a corner of the UK or in a corner of the world wanting to be serious about poetry, but also geographically, there might be disadvantage in a way. What would be your advice for them? I think uh, if I'm honest, Rama, a lot of it is good luck. Mm. And that doesn't take away from the hard work that goes on behind making a book or making the poems. But I think sometimes a book sort of breaks through beyond the sort of the circle of poetry and poetry readers. And that was mm. probably what happened with Black Country. Mm. It, it maybe just touched the right feeling at the right time. And I think even though it, it, it's a really specifically located book, it's about the black country, actually a lot of it is about the experience of loving a place, mm -hmm. of leaving a place, of leaving behind home, leaving behind language, wondering will you go back, keeping that home alive within your relationship mm -hmm. or within your children. Um, so I think that... that sort of thread running through it allowed it to move out further from the black country. As a poet from the Midlands, I know exactly what you mean. If you don't live in a big city, it's impossible mm. to sort of get the right connections mm. and get your work known. But actually I feel, touch wood, that things are really changing in terms of of how open we are to sort of poets from other regions so, since I started working which is about 10 12 years now I feel this amazing kind of energy in not only the black country but in Birmingham and Coventry and the whole of the West Midlands and also it's a really supportive energy and I think that's a really important thing to mention that when one poet sort of rises from an area you've then got this beautiful chance to lift up other poets in your area mm. to work with them collaboratively, to run workshops. I run a workshop in Birmingham for poets that we're both part mm. of. 
to organise readings, to be part of reading, mm. to support local presses, mm. to say yes to doing events in small places in your region because actually it attracts different audiences. Mm. So it's, you've then got the power, which is a really lovely power, to be able to say, come on, we've got this great, great region, we've got great poets, mm. time to pay attention. Um, and it does feel, I don't know, do you feel this too, that there is this real sort of increase in energy in the middle? It's got brilliant presses, it's got great poets. Yes, so definitely. It's a, it's a blooming ecosystem, mm. isn't it? So we have Writing West Midlands, hi Jonathan. We have Nine Arches Press, hi Jane Kamein. <gasps> and Casey Bailey, yes. the current Birmingham Poet Laurie. Yeah. brilliant. Yeah. It's brilliant. Did you see all this like rap online? <laughs> I saw him at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> really? He was at Buckingham Palace the other day, Roma. Hi, Casey. Casey Bailey. <laughs> no way. Yeah, he's brilliant. Mm, never talk about this, Casey. <laughs> Speaking as if we're close. <laughs> no, Casey is also coming on Chao with Roma. Is he? So, beautiful. Uh, the way he raps and he mix, mixes mm. music. I think he's just a really beautiful ambassador for the region because mm. he's young, he's got this amazing enthusiasm. Mm. He's a teacher, he's a dad, he's grown up in Birmingham. I think he's got this amazing heart, yes, which just seems definitely. to translate beautifully into the work, doesn't it? And again, that's about lifting that quality yeah. up. Not by that actual person, not, not them lifting it up, but the community that yeah. surrounds them needs yeah. to lift them up as well. Yeah. And I do hear you as well when you say it's about luck, but also it's about your community mm -hmm. and knowing or having some idea, you don't really need to know, but having some idea of where to look. Organisations like Writing West Midlands yes. will point you in the direction of poetry groups, mm -hmm. workshop groups, schemes, competitions, yeah. events you can do. So I've just finished this little book which is Yes, tell us about that. Well, this is a beautiful yeah. little pamphlet. It's in a collaboration mm -hmm. with a photographer from a black country. But when I was thinking about this book the other day, actually, so many people mm -hmm. go into the making of a book that you don't see. So you've got, not, it's not just the poet or the mm -hmm. photographer. You've got the small presses with their tireless, brilliant editors. You've got workshop groups. You've got the poets reading each other's poems and giving feedback. You've got the schemes, the mentoring schemes, the grassroots nights that put poets mm. on. So many people mm. go into the making of a poetry book or into the making of a poet. Mm. I think it's really important to kind of acknowledge that. It's not just like any poet yes. just sits there in their room. Ta-da! Exactly. Writes a perfect poem and then it's out in the yeah. world. I think that's also a part of my reason why if you see the acknowledgement page of anti medic mm. world sickness, it's like a love letter to my mentors. Yeah. A single book is an ecosystem yeah. of yeah. its own. Would you read as a closing poem, perhaps from The Dereliction? I will. I love all your titles, you know. It's like Thanks, you've got Roma. Black Country and then The Republic of Motherhood and then The Dereliction. Oh, The Dereliction. <laughs> dereliction. It actually comes from this beautiful photo. So it's a collaboration with the photographer Tom Hicks. And this is the photo, oh, the dereliction. Yes. So it's this beautiful pub just somewhere in the black country with its neck curtains blowing mm. out, like a lovely wedding dress. Um, so the poem I'll read was the first poem that came from this collaboration. It's a real black country poem, because it's called Yam Yam Steiner. Do you know this term, Yam Yams? Yeah, yeah. We're <laughs> all speaking yes, Yam Yams. Yam Yams, it's like an affectionate <laughs> word for people from the black country, like yes. Yam 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 Yam. Um, so, oh my god, yeah. I love this poem. So here we are, Roma and I, Yam Yam Steiner in Winchester. <laughs> and it reminds you, Roma, I've always got this secret dream mm -hmm. that if I wasn't a poet, I would be one of those ladies that runs a cafe. Do you know, like in a porter cabin on an oh, industrial estate or yeah. an A road? You know what, to be honest, you could imagine it. I could imagine you? it. Yeah, you have Dishing this kind out of... my bacon. <laughs> you have that kind of aura. But whenever I say that to my partner, mm. he always says, it's not all it's cracked up to be, Liz. Oh. It's not what you think it is. But if ever you're looking for me and you can't find me, you will be I'll there. I'll be at Yam Yam Steiner. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll read this. And part. you know, in other versions of this universe, yes, the that's, poet that's is a where diner I am. girl. <laughs> yeah. Frying my eggs. <laughs> Yam Yam Steiner. Somewhere beyond all this, I'm elbows down on the counter in Yam Yam's diner. Sunflower oil slicking my ponytail. Ruby t-shirt. Blue apron. Our lady a perpetual sucker. All a hard-working man might stoop to kiss the knuckles of. Stagger out in the diesel yellow morning yearning to taste. 
serving a little chick and bab. Tea slurry with sugar. Bacon with a sly crisp of skin. Bread thick as a dictionary. Flip to the entry, clam to Jeff. I'd love them, the men. In their overalls and boots you could stamp on the towels of. The tired ones, the trodden, the young, their chins still soft with bum fluff. I'd hold their dreams so tenderly, understanding that there is no heaven but this, a grease-spangled porter cabin, the rhyme the body yields when it's finally full. So get it whilst you can. By three I'll be gone. Tables wiped, shutters down, already feeling the afternoon sun on that soft, bare spot on my nape. The scent of fat and salt swinging like incense as I pull out the pins and let loose my hair. <laughs> oh my God, that, the yum yum girl. So if you can't find me at the reading later, <laughs> you know where I'll be. <laughs> But it's past three now, so the yum yum diner should have sure, been. I've gone, sure. pulling out my pins. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lizzie Berry. And please um, do get a copy of the Dereliction from Hercules Editions. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye.